I'm Zach Morris. I'm CFM's uh, vice president and a founding member of the Young Professionals Group that is hosting a web series. Uh, well, I want to say, well, everybody, uh, thanks for attending. I uh, hope you learned some. We had some really good sessions so far uh, with some new hunters. And one of the important things to know how to do is what to do with your harvest when you're successful. Uh, John Wallace is here. He is since forever uh, out in Ohio. He used to be uh, part of our Missouri Young Professor crew when he was the regional rep for forever here in Missouri. John also is at on Instagram and has quite a bit of knowledge of uh, cooking, uh, preparing different species. Uh, and I've learned a lot from him from hunt and cookouts afterwards. So I'll share some of his knowledge. Um, he's really friendly and I think it's going to be a fun conversation. So uh, like Colton said in our other ones, so feel free to um, turn on off and your, your mic off. Uh, chime in when you have a question. Go ahead, John. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Colton. Thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, if you don't feel comfortable, turn on your camera, uh, but you can turn. I, I really feed off of other people's uh, energy and uh, their questions and such. So if at any point, again, I'll, I'll be trying to look at the chat, um, but I was looking to uh, maybe gain some interest or knowledge of what you're in are so that we kind of spend more time focusing on uh, rather than making the conversation somewhere that uh, may not be on point for where you're in your uh, hunting career. You know, obviously most of us uh, here are, are to learn about the basics of hunting. Um, follow up uh, with Zach's, yeah, so I great years in Missouri and only been to Ohio to, to get back to family. Um, but the outdoor resources in Missouri are about as good as you can get anywhere in the country. So uh, plenty of opportunity to get out after small game. Um, I don't know if I'll talk too much about uh, prep for fish today. They're really one of my strong suits, but small game, uh, maybe deer, um, turkey, maybe. But we'll talk about some prep from the harvest um, soon after harvest, uh, getting it to your vehicle and then from the vehicle house and ultimately uh, either on you or maybe it takes a pit stop in the freeze. So um, I, my knowledge um, is... I do have knowledge. I'm not a professional chef. i taught. I watched a little food network uh, early in my marriage. We got sick of eating hamburger, or most times it was deer helper. Uh, uh, helper got me through college. And I, mean, I guess for those that, so a hamburger helper, you buy it in the store for like a dollar a box and different flavors. And that's, that's a lot of what we ate. And we got tired of it. So we wanted to expand what we were eating. A lot of food network. Um, and then folks started coming around on TV. Um, little did they know they would come a little more major. But Steve, uh, Meat Eater, is a big influence of mine. And in as is Hank Shaw. So Steve Vernella or Meat Eater uh, for Steve. And then uh, Hank Shaw gathered cook on almost all of his platforms. Uh, he's got a, a website called Honest Food. And there's a little hyphen in there on dash food.net um, and all the recipes you would want uh, some of them are kind of fancier so they're not level well you know you may be a level hunter but you may not be an entry level chef or cook looking into um, and then um, actually fall first deer season in Missouri I kind of looked into instant and was like you know what's this all about and uh, pretty much shared my wild game cooking on Instagram because no one wanted to see it on Facebook. So uh, the Instagram community of wild game cooking um, a lot, um, as it is on probably a lot of platforms are on Instagram. As Zach mentioned, I'm a game cook on Instagram. And many of the accounts I follow are wild game. Um, you know, most of them have some sort of wild game inspiration because um, there's a lot of pages out there that are really, really great. Um, some have gotten fairly large now. So um, if you're looking for different meal ideas or things, definitely give, give that a look. Um, so a lot of people, when it comes to wild game, not familiar with it, the, like the most common is it's gamey. Um, and that kind of, I don't want to say it makes me cringe a little bit, but Oftentimes, you know, let's use deer meat, for example, because I think that's probably the most common 
wild game meat introduced to new folks. Um, it doesn't, it, it can be uh, more flavorful if maybe proper uh, things weren't taken, uh, taken care of, but you know, deer tastes like deer. It's not gonna taste like beef. Um, Grass-fed beef tastes different than grain-fed beef. Some people really don't care uh, about the taste of grass-fed beef. So, you know, everything has its own taste and uh, you gotta obviously kind of know that going into it. But if proper measures are taken, which we'll, we'll try to cover uh, today during this session, sometimes it's very, very hard for folks to tell that I'm feeding them deer meat. Um, the other big thing is, is most wild game, doesn't matter the species really, it's very lean. So there's not nearly the marbling of fat, which can create moisture, could also create flavor. Um, so you either have to, uh, you know, add olive oil or add butter in, in certain cases, or just don't overcook the meat. Um, some things you obviously like birds, you may need to cook more well done, uh, like pheasant or quail on your waterfowl. Uh, those are most um, preferred either rare or mid rare. Um, you know, you can go more medium if that's, uh, if you're not into that, but knowing that you're going to cook your waterfowl more well done, it's going to have a completely different taste. You may want to look for a different application. Um, but I guess just to um, get started, um, or, and you know, and if anyone has any questions, like if you are looking to really get out this year, maybe you've already been out, you've maybe already harvested some small game or you intend to target certain species and you'd like me to, uh, you know, cover those early, then, um, you know, let me know. I've got the chat here pulled up. Um, I see a question here from Kim, uh, any favorite dove recipes? Um, so dove is a great way to get out in the field. It's very social. Um, I've been taking my kids out dove hunting um, the last few weeks, they're uh, 11 and 12 years old, and they've been knocking down some doves, which has been nice. But I figured somebody was probably going to ask about dove. And rather than share my screen, I'm just going to kind of pull it up with my phone. So hopefully it'll work out. But uh, hopefully you guys can see that. I made some sushi uh, last week, which is pretty cool. Because as you'll hear me say a couple times, is, uh, you know, whatever you like to eat, Go ahead and make it just substitute the protein for the wild game so what i did with the dove and we've made we've made sushi before at the house so something we like to do and uh i have a sous vide cooker or a water water circulator and we put it in there for an hour at 140 degrees and it made it really tender we marinated it too um and some asian flavors and pulled it out and sliced it up and put it inside sushi it was that simple um bacon wrapped like marinated again in, in some uh, any any of your favorite marinades work just fine even things simple as italian dressing or you know a teriyaki mixture uh work really great and then wrap it in bacon and grill it and when the bacon's done the dove is done you can bake it in the oven as well if you don't have a grill um it's pretty pretty versatile the other thing is to uh dice up the meat once it's cooked and add it with cheese and onions and peppers and, and such and put it into a mushroom cap and have stuffed mushrooms. So really anything you put um, uh, your protein in, just uh, make the dish and just uh, exchange it or substitute the wild game. I think that's really applicable to about any game species and any recipe really. Uh, more times than not, the common denominator is you just don't wanna overcook it. Um, you know, you, and again, you can find you know, different species on, you know, how, how much they should be cooked. So, uh, so I guess um, without seeing like anything, I'll, I guess I'll start with doves. So like from the field, um, you know, oftentimes it's in September, so it can be pretty warm. Um, I typically take a cooler with me um, and it's not one of my better coolers. Uh, it's funny enough, you guys can hopefully get a kick out of this. This is my Yeti cooler. So I just pretty much slapped a Yeti cooler sticker on this igloo. I think it's an igloo, I don't know, but the lid like comes off of it. It's just kind of a really junky cooler that serves a purpose of putting dove, uh, frogs, if we go frog hunting, um, you know, you could put, uh, you know, you know, a couple duck breasts in there, things of that nature, but we use it for doves all the time and um, it gets the job done. We typically have like an ice pack, you know, most people have ice packs in their freezer put one of those in there, put it in the car. When you leave, if you were to have, another thing I didn't bring with me is like a Walmart sack uh, or over here in Ohio, we call them Kroger sacks, but just a little plastic bags. And we, we throw our birds in there. And if you didn't have it on ice, there could be a lot of internal heat inside those birds and could maybe possibly spoil your meat quicker. So 
to have an ice pack thrown in there um, works just fine. Oftentimes too, if you wanna do a little bit of field prep or processing in the field, we use uh, Ziploc bags quite a bit. So just like the gallon size bags, throw them in your cooler and uh, that'll get you uh, pretty good until you get home. Um, something else you may want to look at is a, a field knife. Uh, this happens to be um, an outdoor edge knife with replaceable razor blades, which is nice because they stay uh, really sharp. Um, but just a standard pocket knife will work if it's, you know, really sharp. So just any, any sort of knife, a fillet knife, pocket knife, uh, something to possibly process uh, or at least start the process of your birds on the tailgate. Um, this may have been mentioned during Zach's waterfowl talk, but when transporting um, certain species, you want to make sure you're still able to identify it, uh, you know, like your waterfowl and such. Um, but those are just some simple tools that uh, help keep your meat cold and not getting them too hot from spoiling until you get them home. Um, so I started, when I started as a hunter, uh, I had no idea how to process my own game. So we just, specifically deer, we would take it to a, a processor and have them um, skin it, process it, and give it back to us. And there was obviously a cost associated with that. Um, and my wife and I are pretty budget conscious, so we determined that we were going to start processing our own uh, deer meat. And I had never done it before, and it was actually I shot a deer at my buddy's place, and we said, hey, let's just give it a shot. So we got out of like the biggest plastic bowls he had in his kitchen. We put them on a table. We had the deer laying out in his garage. We got, you know, the best knives we could find in his house, and we just started. We skinned it, um, you know, and typically skinning a deer um, can be, there's two schools of thought. One is to try to get the skin off as quick as possible in order to cool down the meat. And that's definitely applicable when it's uh, early. So I think in Missouri, deer season comes in September 15th. Um, so getting that skin off allows the meat to cool down faster. Um, in the winter months, it's not as important, um, but get the skin off. And then we just started hacking at it, you know? And our thought process was we may not be uh, as efficient as most butchers, but we may take the time to get cuts of meat or, you know, more cuts of meat that they may miss because of the speed of getting it, uh, getting all the deer through the line. Um, so we started doing our own deer in 2012 and we did it very basic. I just broke it down into steaks, uh, took the cuts of meat, made them into steaks or left them whole as roast, or uh, we did have a really uh, cost-effective grinder. I think we bought it from northern freight or something like that northern tool it was like 99 dollars for a grinder and it got the job done and i guess before that we had a kitchenaid mixer with a grinder attachment um and again it, it got the job done um you know uh it's just we, we've since upgraded but you don't necessarily need the the most high-tech grinder and also sometimes your family or friends may have one that you can borrow um so that that's going to be something we'll talk about here a little bit later um, the, a couple of big components I wanted to talk about, and like I said, I'm sure you've probably covered this in the previous sessions, but, you know, as a hunter, you should look to respect the harvest, respect the animal as much as possible. Um, so that's obviously a quick, ethical, clean kill. Um, and then it's also trying to utilize as much of that animal as possible. Um, not only is that just the right thing to do, but also, um, you know, if you were to take pictures or if you were to share your stories, you want to make sure you're setting a great image for hunters. Um, so with small game, um, typically, you know, with squirrels, let's say, you know, uh, you would skin the squirrel and you've got the four quarters, the two front legs, the two hind legs. Uh, there are two, you know, somewhat loin pieces that are worth, uh, worth eating there all along the back. Um, so that's a pretty good portion of that squirrel. Uh, rabbits would be the same exact scenario. Um, you could either leave them whole or, again, quarter them or break them down. Um, I've even taken both of those species and boned them out completely and then um, either ate the meat like that or I've run it through a grinder and made um, cased sausages, which is more of a, an advanced technique uh, to start using cased meats, but maybe you could already be doing it. It's something that um, using that small game is a good effective recipe for that. Um, when you start getting into, like, turkey hunting, um, there's a, there's a lot of hunters out there. I would say this, there's a lot of hunters that they've been mentored in a way that you only need to breast out the bird. Okay. So whether it's geese, it's ducks, it's, um, turkeys, wild turkeys, you just breast it out. 
And that's really unfortunate because like on a wild turkey between the legs and the thighs, there's probably close to three pounds of meat combined, I would say, pretty close to it. Um, and then on waterfowl, uh, I'll be honest, I don't always keep the legs because if I'm only shooting one or two ducks, it, it, you know, I'd have to freeze them individually because I may not eat them right away. But, you know, it, it, if, you, if you're new to waterfowl hunting, I would, I would encourage you to experience as much of that animal as possible. The big thing to note with um, legs of most wild game versus, say, domestically raised chickens or turkeys um, is the legs can be more, um, they could have a lot more tendons in it and uh, they're not as easy to eat like off the bone. So you have to do more of a slow and slow braised approach where you're using some sort of liquid and you're typically maybe even going as long as like six to eight hours in order to have that meat break down. So like low setting, six to eight hours, have it get really tender. So you're cooking those separate than the breast meat in most cases. Um, but if you're up to it, um, going in after the heart of any animal for that matter, but specifically birds, I really like to eat the hearts and livers of birds. Uh, some people aren't liver people. Some people you know, may not uh, like the concept of eating hearts, but I, I assure you they're really good. Um, and I've got a recipe that maybe if we have time later, I can share a recipe for hearts and livers and on birds, and you know, I'm sure I can't see your, your faces or your hands here, but maybe you can drop a note in the comments, uh, how many people like chicken tenders, right? So you have a chicken breast and a chicken tender. The tender is the tenderloin underneath the breast. And geese, ducks, doves, turkeys, they all have a tenderloin underneath the breast. And sometimes I, I remove those for two purposes. One, the, the breast will cook more evenly because it doesn't have this extra set of uh, meat underneath of it. So it, it cooks more evenly. Um, also, uh, my guests or my family don't have to know that those exist and I can cook them up and eat it myself. So that's, that's a perk of uh, doing all the work and doing the cooking. Um, what we see here, uh, how do you determine which cuts and organs of an animal not to use? So great question. Um, I'll be honest, I'll give you kind of a somewhat funny answer. Um, and I, what I mean by that is you'll see where I'm going with it, but there probably are no cuts or organs that are off limits. And I say that like you wouldn't want to eat, like, like there's some stuff that's got like some fluid in it that it'd be pretty obvious that you don't want to eat that. But I think the liver, the heart uh, with birds, um, this is unique to birds. There's something called a gizzard and you know it right away when um, you're going to get your hands in there and you're going to pull the guts out of these, these birds. There's kind of a hard... Um, a hard organ that's kind of normally got like a shiny material on it and it is a gizzard and you could probably be looking on your phone and and googling this too at some point but a, a birds will eat um, grit or rocks different things and they eat it it goes into their gizzard and they use that to break down their food right their greens their grains and so on and um it's a muscle that works really really hard and it can be a very tough cut um, but if you learn how to process a gizzard uh, you can eat that. Um, it's, I, I think if I know Zach well enough, he, he probably eats a good bit of gizzards. And I don't mind them either, but um, I've got to have a whole lot of them in order for it to make, make the effort worthwhile. Um, but I'd say that's probably where I, about where I draw the line. Um, Zach and I were talking last night. Hank Shaw, again, very well-known wild game cook, and he's a great author. He's got several cookbooks, wild game cookbooks. He has a pretty somewhat famous duck tongue recipes so he like fries up the duck tongues and uh i think it's kind of a tradition you know in asia and such so there's there's not too much off limits um you can use the feet and such for making stock there's a lot of uh gelatin and different things in there which are really healthy for you um you just want to make sure you rinse them and stuff first before you put them in your stock pot um i'll get back to the deer ribs question later so don't let me forget that um because I've, I've actually struggled with deer ribs and not had much success, but there's probably a good bit of YouTube videos out there now, but we'll get back to that. Um, so, and then in regards to using other parts of the animal, um, you know, on a dove, there's probably not much in the way of feathers or the wings or, you know, or things of that nature. Now, if you do have a young dog, a young bird dog that you're looking to like, you know, go hunting with, you can use the wings to uh, help train your bird dog. Or again, you can give them to someone else who may be training a bird dog. Uh, but the, the key is, is just to try to respect the animal as much as possible and use as much of it as possible. Um, and for that, for what it's worth, again, if you 
uh, find me on Instagram. Don't hesitate to uh, shoot me a comment or shoot me a private message with any question. Um, and Zach on here as well. Um, there's a lot of us, again, in the wild game cooking community that'd be happy to help you. On Facebook, there's a lot of wild game cooking private groups. Again, I'll, I'll shout out Hank Shaw has a group called Hunt, Gather, Cook. Last I checked, there was, you know, over 15,000 people in the group and it's, it's very civil. Uh, they're very, um, like Colton had mentioned, they um, don't discriminate whether you're a brand new hunter, um, whether you're an advanced hunter, a great cook, not a great cook. Um, and you can learn quite a bit. So there's a lot in there. Um, um, there one, of the, one of the things that comes to mind about using all of the animal um, is plucking birds whole and cooking whole birds. Um, can you talk about how you might make the decision to do that and then what maybe extra steps you might want to take if you're going to do that with a bird? Great, great question. So going back to this comment I made about just breasting your birds, right? So literally what that means is um, you are going to either make a slit down the breast, the breast plate, because typically the bird is facing up, you're looking at the belly. Um, a lot of times you can take your thumbs, let's see here, you can take your thumbs and you kind of press down and out and it exposes the uh, breast of the animal. Give me one second here. So, these are some doves that my kids and I shot uh, early September. And you'll see where we've exposed the breastplate. And doves, again, are maybe the one, the one um, exclusion there or the exception where you may not find it necessary to keep the legs of the dove because they are pretty small. But you can pluck a dove and eat them whole. There are several, again, very prominent recipes out there. I've already mentioned some of the names of the, the cooks and such that have those. But um, So you can pluck your doves as well. It's not a bad a habit to get into, but it does take more time. But on um, ducks, typically you'll know whether or not you have shot a duck, um, what I would say very well or not very well. And what I mean by if you shot it well in regards to cooking, it means you've only put a few pellets in it. If you've happened to really hit it square and it's maybe not in the best of shape, it may not be the best specimen to pluck that duck. That may be one where you have to breast it out you still keep the legs and such, but you breast it out and you let those breasts soak in water. Um, overnight, we'll get to water here in just a minute and, and kind of the key role it can play if um, your wild game has been shot up a pretty good bit. Um, but typically with a duck, you know, you've got it in your hand like this um, and you kind of take your thumb and you kind of pinch the feathers and just roll it back. And you kind of go in like this and you get the hang of it and there's really no wrong way. It's just you're either gonna be more effective or less effective, but there's really no wrong way. You can sit there and go like this if you want. There's just gonna be a lot of little pin feathers that kind of look like uh, arm hairs and such. And I know it sounds really gross, but it, you know, uh, my wife kind of flips out about it. I just take a lighter later and then kind of burn them off. Um, but the better you can get with, you know, using that roll method, next thing you know, you're looking at, um, you know, two breasts with the skin on. A lot of times if you buy domestic duck at the store, it's got the skin and the fat on it. And they're typically a lot fattier, the domestic ones, a lot fattier than your wild ducks. Sometimes your wild ducks won't have any fat at all, especially early season. Um, if you're in mid-Missouri or you're around Missouri where some of these uh, controlled draw rooms are for waterfowl hunting, um, they can sometimes uh, gorge themselves on the flooded corn that you're hunting over and they can be really fat, which is, is a really good thing if you're gonna pluck your birds and have the skin on. So. By having the skin on, you can then smoke your birds and um, it allows you to leave the skin and fat on, which leaves it moist and uh, just provides more flavor. You can sear them with the skin down and have like a crispy skin duck. Um, whereas, and, and if you if you pluck it and leave the skin on and you decide you wanna do more of a grilled bacon wrapped uh, duck or something, you can do that. You just have to remove the duck skin and the duck fat, and you can still go back to what you originally wanted. If you don't keep the, the skin and the fat, it really limits you on some of the things that you can't cook now because you don't have that fat and skin component. Um, you could also, if you don't plan to cook with the skin and fat on, you can still pluck your birds and you can keep the skin and the fat and gather all that and put it in a pot and render it. Um, you've probably heard folks eating, uh, cooking with duck fat. Duck fat's very rich. Um, 
and it can be very good, even wild duck fat. And what Hank Shaw would say is, you know, some ducks, depending on what they're eating, uh, may not taste as good. And sometimes that flavor could possibly live in the fat. And so what he says is your nose, your nose knows, right? So if your nose says it doesn't smell good, then it may not be the best to cook with. But I've done it a few times. Again, I don't have a chance oftentimes to have a lot of ducks in hand, but I have, uh, there's, you just go to YouTube and, and uh, rendering duck fat and you'll learn how to do it and you can cook with it. And that's another great method uh, for utilizing more of the animal. Um, I'm gonna, on that note, I mentioned um, tastes, that gamey taste, getting back to that. So on waterfowl specifically, and I'd say it's probably with deer and other wild game as well, the flavor lives in like the, a lot of people call it blood that's in the meat within the fibers, but really it's like a, a protein, like a myoglobin protein. And that's just a fancy word for basically, if you just want to say the blood within the meat, I think that's how most people probably recognize it. But getting as much of that out of your meat as possible is a huge key to having great tasting wild game. So I oftentimes joke around that I use more paper towels than any man should, um, but they really come in handy. So if I shoot ducks or geese, for example, uh, let's just say ducks, I take them home. Um, I start the processing process outside. You don't want to start plucking your ducks in the house or around the house um, for obvious reasons. You can get in trouble for that uh, from your better half or just if nothing else, you've got a bunch of feathers laying around your house. So uh, find a trash can and dump those into as you're plucking. Um, but once I get the meat off of the bird, um, sometimes it can be bloody. So I put it in water, not salt water. Um, a lot of people say you put it in salt water to draw the blood out. And the reason the, the salt does help draw the blood out is because it tightens the meat and forces the blood out, but you've now made your meat a little bit uh, tougher. So I found that with a little bit more patience and allowing it to soak in the water with just plain water and you can replace the water as needed. Sometimes you may need to massage the meat a little bit to get some of the more bloody spots out. Um, but I'll do that at overnight at most. I won't leave it uh, in the fridge in water for more than a in a day, uh, but I take it out of there, I drain it, and then I put it basically back in the same bowl with paper towels lining the bottom. And that paper towel will draw that moisture, that blood out of the meat, and it'll be visibly red, um, the meat will. I think I've actually got a video uh, that I may uh, show here. Let's see, this is related to your meat. This isn't the one. I may have to just find it later. But I promise you, if you can get that fluid out of your meat, your meat's gonna taste so much better. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read the chat here. All right, yeah, so Zach says he may have some birds in the fridge in which he can uh, possibly show everyone how it draws that blood away from the meat. And then once you get the blood drawn away from the meat, uh, that may take a day or two. Um, you know, there's really no rush. I mean, it, it stays in the fridge just like any of your other proteins would. Um, you can either cook it at that point or at that point, I would put it in a vac sealer and put it in the fridge. And you don't necessarily need a vac sealer, um, but I would strongly suggest not just putting it in a Ziploc bag and putting it in the freezer to forget about it because it's going to get freezer burnt. So you either need to go with saran wrap and like a butcher paper method, um, which has its downfalls because you can't visibly see the meat and if it has gone bad um, or if, you know if there's got a bunch of air in it so if you can invest in a vac sealing system there's very affordable ones out there um, I think probably far less than a hundred dollars maybe somewhere in the sixty dollar range you can get a vac sealer and they make them you know much nicer um, and you can use that for leftovers at the house you can use it for gardening um, if you've got gardens, you can blanch your vegetables and use it. So there's a lot of uses for a vac sealer. I, I strongly recommend it. Um, but yeah, you put it in your vac sealer and you label it appropriately so you know what it is, when it was harvested, and you can pull that out at a later time. Um, the other thing I was going to mention in regards to um, taste, and I may have, again, I may have to get back to it, but um, those are probably some of the most important tips is getting it to from the field to the house where it's been chilled and it doesn't have a chance to get real hot. If you happen to forget an ice pack and you have a bunch of doves or squirrels or rabbits, just make sure that they're separated 
uh, in a sense to where they're not in a pile um, sharing the heat, right? You want that heat to escape. And oftentimes uh, with rabbits and squirrels, you may wanna go ahead and at least field dress those animals either immediately after harvesting them. So you can like on a squirrel, you could possibly uh, open up the belly, gut that squirrel and put it in your, your bag, your game bag um, with a rabbit. You could YouTube this, but there's a very simple method where uh, you kind of pinch from the neck and pinch all the way down until the guts come out. I know it's kind of graphic, but um, it's, it's a very effective way to get the guts out of the animal and to cool the inside of that cavity. And you could ultimately uh, skin both the squirrel or the rabbit later when you get to the house. Um, it is better to skin those earlier than later. If you let them get cold or let rigor mortis set in, you take them home, you do it the next day, it can be a lot harder to skin those than um, if you do it you know, within an hour or two after your hunt. Um, and yeah, Zach's saying here, they're, they're notoriously hard to skin. Um, so he skins them as soon as he shoots and which really helps him. And you can most certainly do that. Um, again, I, I say, like I mentioned, uh, Instagram is a great uh, platform for learning about wild game cooking, but I know Colton said he's gonna share this on YouTube and you can find anything on YouTube nowadays. Uh, my kids, you know, love looking at stuff like that. You know, how to, how to field dress a rabbit how to field dress a squirrel, how to break down a squirrel, how to break down a rabbit. Um, all that sort of stuff is at your fingertips. Uh, the biggest thing is just being thoughtful of, of your game. Um, you know, you wouldn't go to the store and, and uh, you know, leave all of your, your groceries out in the car for a long time. You want to get them in the fridge. You want to make sure they're taken care of. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can do that. And like, you know, Colton's saying there, just find it online. So uh, I'm going to look at my notes here. Uh, again, we kind of address the gaminess. There's two ways that you can really help with gaminess. Number one is getting the, the moisture, the fluid, the blood out of the meat. That, that is for deer as well. Now with deer, I don't really soak it in water most times, uh, but I do put it in these tubs as I'm breaking it down and I have them lined with paper towels. And then, because if you were to go to the store and you go to the meat section, you go to the you know, meat department and you buy a um, saran wrapped, steak in a little carton when you lift the steak up what's under there right there's I call it a meat diaper I don't know what the word is for it but there's like a, a draining white little square thing in there that collects all that fluid so if you didn't have that with a beef steak your beef steak would not taste nearly as nice as it does when you do drain that the other way to eliminate or minimize the gaminess which again is just the taste of the animal is to not overcook it so um, pheasants, you want to cook like chicken. Um, however, there's less fat in there, so it can dry out so much faster than chicken. A lot of people have probably eaten dried chicken before, so you want to cook pheasant um, until it is just done, and maybe even slightly before that because it's going to rise as it's coming off of your stovetop or your oven or your grill. Um, so don't overcook it. Um, uh, like I've already mentioned, Waterfowl, you want to probably eat medium rare. Some would say rare. I'm more of a medium guy, but on waterfowl, I typically eat those medium rare. On deer, again, medium rare to medium. Um, you can most certainly eat it well done. It's just going to be a little tougher to eat, and it's going to taste more like the animal um, rather than more like beef. Um, Something else I'll mention too is a grinder. I think I already mentioned it, but if you can buy, if you have a, a KitchenAid mixer, you can buy a grinding attachment. If not, you can invest in a, in a grinder or again, borrow one from someone, but it's a great way to take your meat, uh, put it in, you know, the appropriate, uh, there's these little wild game bags, they're circular. You can buy them um, either online at LEM products, or you can go to Bass Pro Cabela's and with, with ground meat, and whether that's turkey, whether it's do you bone out your squirrels and rabbits, whatever it may be, you can do so much with ground meat. You can make burgers, you can make uh, chili, spaghetti, um, you name it. You can make anything you want. You can buy breakfast sausage seasoning and you could have breakfast sausage. So it's a very uh, versatile way to utilize your wild game. And it's very, um, I don't say user friendly, but it's very approachable. Um, and, you know, it's obviously cooked all the way. So if you're, you're kind of squeamish uh, or new to wild game and you want to kind of get into that world slowly, 
Um, if you could find a way to grind your wild game uh, is a great way to uh, get to get into that. What about adding fat to ground meat, John? What do you recommend there? Great question. So that's that's something that's pretty pretty commonly brought up, um, and this applies. Like, and in most people, it applies to deer, but really, I've added um, fat to small game when I made the sausage or breakfast sausage, the case sausage with the small game. Um, I think every wild game chef, every hunter kind of goes through phases. Um, early on, you want to wrap everything in bacon. You want to add a bunch of pork or, or beef, meat, not even just fat. Just like you buy a pork shoulder, cube it up, and you grind it 50-50 with your deer, right? That's a very great way to basically stretch your pork. You've just doubled the amount of pork in your fridge. Um, then next you may go down to where you're just using say pork fat. I like pork fat more than beef fat. I really only tried beef fat one time and I don't know if it's, I just wasn't used to it or maybe I got some bad fat. I'm not sure, but it just wasn't my style. So I've since gone to buying good pork back fat from a local butcher, local grocery store, or local meat shop. I've got a couple of different options around me and typically they'll sell you the fat typically less than a dollar. So I've, I've paid probably as much as a dollar 20 a pound. I've paid as little as 50 to 70 cents a pound or something like that for pork fat. And then you wanna do it about a 20% ratio. So if you buy ground meat at the store, you're looking at like an 80, 20 mix, or you can have like 73, what is, the, what is that rate come out to be 27, you know? So however fat you like your meat, but I think a 15 to 20% ratio of pork fat to venison or whatever the ground meat may be is an appropriate ratio. It adds flavor, it adds moisture, but you most certainly could do 100% ground venison, ground turkey. Um, it's just not gonna be as um, applicable, say in a, in a burger. So if you're gonna take 100% venison and you're gonna make it into a patty and slap it on the grill, it may fall apart on you. So you may have to kind of use a binder, whether that binder is an egg that binder could be a little bit of breadcrumbs. Um, you know, there's different things you could do to kind of, you know, bind your meat together. Um, but wild game is most certainly very lean. And I guess to that point, um, most deer fat typically is not desirable. It's edible. It's just not desirable. It leaves a really waxy finish on your tongue. Um, so more times than not, most hunters will look to do all they can to get as much of the deer fat not in their finished product. Again, it's, it's edible. It just, um, it doesn't freeze well. Any fat for that matter doesn't freeze really well. Um, so if you're gonna put it in the freezer and get it out a few months later, it could potentially change the taste of your game. Um, but yeah, great question, Zach. Um, the other thing too is, you know, as you're getting into this, you're gonna, you're gonna mess some stuff up, right? Your knife skills may not be that great when you're filleting out the breast of a dove or you're trying to skin a squirrel or skin a rabbit, you're gonna get hair on it, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's fine, like you can, you can eventually pick it off. Obviously, you know, you may eat a few, a few hairs, it's gonna happen, but the only way you're gonna learn is to do it yourself and to get better and better at it. Um, again, there's great videos on how to field dress squirrels and such, but um, practice makes perfect, you know, and even then I, I've been squirrel hunting since I've probably been about 12 and, uh, it's tough to, to skin squirrels. It's not fun. Um, but we do a lot of squirrel hunting because it's great opportunity for my young kids. I've got uh, two boys, 12 and 11 and a daughter who's seven and she's not hunting yet, but she comes out with us and really loves hanging out with the boys. And uh, so we do a lot of squirrel hunting because you can move around. Um, you know, you don't have to sit there and be quiet as long as say deer hunting. So we can, you know, sit for a little while and move, sit for a little while. And typically, you know, not typically, but you know, it's more of a target rich environment than deer, you know? So it's a great way to, um, you know, get the kids out, um, or to get new hunters out. Squirrel hunting, dove hunting, those are probably the two easiest, I don't know if funnest is the word, but the most fun hunts you can go on as a new hunter because it's, you don't have to take it that serious. And what I mean by that, you still obviously want to do proper gun safety and so on, but you don't have to be still and you don't have to be quiet. And uh, so that's something to look into. Um, you know, find, find some of these uh, dove fields that the Missouri Department of Conservation has and uh, look to go into either the online lottery system if they're still doing that or go into the draw rooms. And uh, typically on the first day, if you get drawn, there's a lot of birds in the air. 
Um, regarding recipes, I oftentimes tell people, you know, cook what you like to eat and use the flavors that you like to eat. So if you like garlic, cook with garlic. If you like um, Asian flavors, you know, teriyaki and soy and uh, fresh ginger or whatever, whatever it is you like to eat, start with that because it, that's what you like to eat. Rather than try someone else's recipe, take the flavors and the different dishes you like and just simply substitute the protein uh, from whatever's listed to your appropriate wild game. You know, beef for deer, chicken for pheasant or quail, um, arguably, you know, fried chicken and fried rabbit aren't that far apart, you know. Um, you have to be kind of careful with rabbit and squirrel on the legs uh, and the arms, the, the quarters as we call them. Um, they can be tough if you don't, um, if you don't go through the right methods to kind of keep them tender. But my point is, is, you know, just you don't have to get too fancy with the recipes. And if you want to keep it simple and just season it with salt and pepper and grill it or pan sear it so that you get the full flavor of what it is you're cooking, that is more than appropriate. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely is more respectful to the harvest than, say, marinating it for four days in a very potent marinade and then to where you're eating it, but you don't get a chance to taste the wild game. Like, I'd really encourage you to um, be fairly simple in your recipes early on and get an understanding of what the meat tastes like. And then you, especially if you have cooking skills, um, you know, we'll know how to pair that with certain dishes and such. Um, one of my favorite recipes uh, for birds, and you could use this for chicken as well, but um, I have a knockoff Chick-fil-A recipe. And I say it's knockoff because you, you go on Google and you can find out how to make Chick-fil-A sauce. And most of the ingredients everyone has at their house and you simply marinate the breast of the pheasant. It could be quail, it could be chicken. I mean, it applies to that, um, but you marinate it in dill pickle juice. And you do that for maybe up to a day if you really like pickles. If you don't like pickles as much, maybe go like three, four hours. Um, but you marinate it in pickle juice, you dry it, you dredge it, you fry it, and then you make this Chick-fil-A sauce. And it's very approachable because most folks like Chick-fil-A. Um, and if not, they like fried chicken. So it's a great, great recipe. Um, again, you can find that on my Instagram page somewhere in there. If not, just message me or email me from that page and, and I can get it to you. Um, Zach, did you have something? Oh, I was going to chime in and say that I learned that from you. I was literally about to talk about uh, that, that recipe. So uh, I'll, I will give a plus one to that. Uh, it's the only way I eat pheasant anymore. I'm going to I'm gonna find a recipe here. I'm going to find it. Got it on here somewhere. Yeah, we also had a question a while back, John, about uh, deer ribs. Um, so if you get a chance to, to circle back to that, that'd be great. Yes, I'll have to find that, that Chick-fil-A uh, recipe later. I can see here. Can I share my screen, Colton? You should be able to. Yep. Can you guys see that? You guys see it on there? Yes, we can. So yeah, that's it right there. You know, uh, some pickles, some Chick-fil-A sauce, uh, fry it and either eat it with a bun or without a bun, but uh, it's your pheasant breast pickle juice. The milk and the egg and the flour is for your dredge. The salt and pepper is to season the flour. You've got your cooking oil. So you have pretty simple ingredients. Um, typically you've got pickles in the house so just don't steal too much of your pickle juice to dry out your pickles. And then your sauce is mayonnaise, honey, barbecue sauce, yellow mustard, Dijon mustard and lemon juice. And um, again, all fairly common ingredients. Um, another one, since I've got my screen shared, this is what I call ramaki. So you may hear a lot of hunters talking about poppers. Okay. So if you go to the, go to a restaurant, you get poppers. It is a jalapeno with cream cheese that's breaded and fried. So a very popular entry level recipe, a very common recipe because I don't want to stereotype all hunters, but most hunters aren't great cooks. Um, so they simply take a jalapeno, they put some cream cheese, and it could be dove, it could be duck, it could be pheasant, it could be deer. And then they, they season it, and they wrap it in bacon, and they grill it. And it's really good. Um, 
for me, that's one of the main sources of inspiration for starting my Instagram pages. I wanted to try to, as you read my Instagram page, it says cooking wild game and inspiring others new ways to try it because so many sportsmen and women just wrap their game in bacon and it's good, but one bacon's expensive. Like if bacon's not cheap and it also overpowers the game. Um, so that said, here we are staring at this, but it's not a popper. It's if you Google Ramaki, I think some of the more traditional Ramaki recipes is a bacon wrapped date or a bacon wrapped water chestnut, crazy enough. Um, but this is just simply marinated dove wrapped in bacon. And then I typically, um, you can maybe see on there some brown sugar candy coating, like a glaze, like you would like on a, on a honey ham or something. But on the marinade, there's definitely a lot of ingredients, but most of them are pretty common. Um, we're, John, we're still seeing the pheasant recipe. Oh, all righty. Give me a second. And I was going to ask you about the pheasant recipe. Do you tenderize your meat when you do that? You pound it out? Um, I don't think I do. Okay. Um, you could, but I don't believe I, I do. I do, um, but I didn't know if you needed to. No, you don't necessarily need to. Um, but it, again, it doesn't, doesn't hurt. Uh, as long as you don't uh, tenderize it too much to where you're putting holes in it and such. You guys see the dove recipe now? Yes. Yeah, we got it now. Thanks. Awesome. So this is my sweet, savory, spicy sugar glaive dove ramaki. So um, it's definitely got a lot of sweetness to it. I put honey and brown sugar in the marinade oftentimes, um, just depending on how sweet you want it. Uh, you don't have to do that. And then I put brown sugar uh, caramelized or glazed on top of the bacon. Um, a lot of these you'll see are um, more appetizers than they are maybe main entrees because I don't have a lot of wild game in my freezer. So I use it to take to um, holidays or parties and use it as more of a conversation starter than I do um, an actual uh, uh, entree. So it's, you know, it's however you want to go about it. Uh, the only other thing I'll say, and then I'll probably open it up to questions, is, um, you know, I started out in 2012 with the KitchenAid grinder attachment, a knife, um, and I did buy some meat tubs to put, like, big, big portions of meat in. But over the years, um, well, I'd say probably for the first three or four years, I didn't add anything to my, um, to my repertoire. I already had the back sealer because we got that as a wedding gift. Um, but over the years, as I wanted to, to expand my wild game cooking, I bought um, a smoker, I bought a stuffer, I bought a, uh, an upgraded grinder from the grinding attachment. Um, and you can add that sort of stuff as you go and as you get more comfortable in breaking down your animals, as you get more comfortable with cooking and understanding recipes and different things like that. So um, I see here, Trista has a question. Um, and I want to give her a shout out too. She said something earlier. Um, yeah, Steve Rinella has a great video on deer ribs. So um, I know Zach had brought that up. So deer ribs, I, I have attempted to make them um, and they, I've eaten them, but they are not my favorite. Um, so I've, I've typically, what I do is I just bone out the ribs and then I throw that meat into my grind pile. Uh, and so it all gets ground up. Um, that's also what I do with my deer heart. So I've eaten deer heart recipes. And again, it's not just it's not one of my favorites and it's definitely not one of my wife's favorites. The kids do like it, but I've gotten to the point where I just take my hearts and I grind it up into the ground meat and nobody ever knows. If anyone tells my mother-in-law, uh, Colton, I will no longer do any uh, young professional videos. So uh, between you, me, and, and not my mother-in-law. So um, squirrel recipes, I will tell you kind of a technique. And once you learn this technique, you can then do several different recipes um, with your squirrel. So um, again, I already mentioned one, boning it out and then grinding it. And then you could put it into either into a sausage or you can uh, just add pork fat to it and breakfast seasoning and you have squirrel breakfast sausage. That would be really easy to do. But if you take your, your portions, so you have your quarters and maybe your back, so like your whole back, and maybe you chop that in half. So you've got six pieces. You've got your two, uh, front four quarters and your back has been split into two chunks. And you can season that with salt and pepper, um, or maybe like a Montreal steak seasoning, something like that. But you don't need to season it too terribly much. But salt and pepper really does work quite well. 
and you brown it. I like to cook in cast iron a lot, but you don't necessarily have to cook in cast iron, but you will want something that is oven safe because we're gonna put this into the oven. So you brown it and on all sides. And then you, if you want, you can saute an onion. So it just adds a little bit of moisture because as the onion cooks down, it's gonna add some moisture to the pan. Also adds flavor. If you don't like onions, you don't, this optional, you wouldn't need to do it. And then you would add to your skillet or your pan, um, like anywhere from like a quarter to possibly a half a cup of a liquid. That liquid could be water, could be chicken stock, could be beef stock. It doesn't really matter that it's beef stock and you're cooking squirrel. It, it honestly doesn't matter. Um, if you make your own stock, if you have beer at the house, you could, have, you could add beer to it. You just need the liquid. And so after you've browned it, you either have the onions in there or you don't. You add your liquid, you cover it. So if you don't have a lid for your cast iron or whatever, you can use heavy duty aluminum foil or take regular aluminum foil and double it up so that you try to get a good seal on it so that that liquid stays in there. And you put it in the oven at 225, so really low, 225 for like two hours, maybe three. You could always pull it out, check it and put it back in if you have to, but um, it kind of braises in there. And when you pull it out, um, be careful when you lift the foil because you could get like steam come up in your face. You should be left with super tender, fall off the bone squirrel meat. The same would, same would apply with rabbit too. Um, but squirrel's more tough than rabbit in most cases, but it's super tender. So at that point, you pick the meat off the bone and you can then simply add barbecue sauce. Um, you could put it inside a pot pie, like chicken pot pie. So you just take the meat, chop it up, Put it with your veggies and your filler and you've got pot pie. Um, so those are just a couple of things to do but once you um, get it off the bone really like the world is your oyster I guess the squirrel is your oyster. So you could take that meat throw a little taco seasoning in there some onions and peppers and make fajitas quesadillas. It's just loose meat and you just put it in whatever vessel or vehicle that you want to put it in. Zach says uh, using a buffalo chicken dip. So exactly. So I if you go to my Instagram page and you go to my highlights, you'll see buffalo chicken dip. And I use my turkey legs. I told you like a lot of folks can get in a bad habit of not keeping the legs and thighs of their turkeys, specifically the legs. The thighs can be really easy to cook. The legs have a lot of tendons in them and they, you have to pick the meat off the bone. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of meat. And so we will go through the process of putting the legs in a crock pot. Um, we did buy an instant pot. Um, here this last Christmas. And so we've been learning how to use the Instant Pot, which just speeds things up. But you pick that meat out and I've gone as far as even putting it in a food processor once it's picked out and all the tendons are out of there, just to kind of pulse up that meat and then just throw it into a buffalo chicken dip as you would any other recipe. So that's a kind of a way to use like the, the off cuts, you know, like when I say off cuts, like not tender. So pheasant legs would apply to that. And it, you know, when you're using a shotgun, obviously, so squirrels, rabbits, birds, and you're using a shotgun, you wanna be very conscientious that there could be lead or steel shot in your wild game. And one thing about putting your meat in a food processor, oftentimes if you have your, your ear, you can, you can hopefully hear either a piece of bone that may have snuck in or a piece of shot that may have snuck in. Um, and so then you gotta go through and dig through there to try to find it. Um, worst case, you leave it in there and uh, you, you know, you almost hope you find it instead of a guest, but uh, it's a great way to kind of find that. But buffalo chicken dip is a crowd favorite. And again, you don't have to tell people what's in it, um, you know, until afterwards, because they won't know any different. So I think uh, we've been at it a pretty good long time. And I'd love to hear from anyone if you have any questions. I appreciate all those that have stuck, stuck on here. And I love seeing, um, you know, that most of the crowd, I believe, was uh, ladies or women. So that's incredibly important to get women in the outdoors. Um, at Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, we kind of have a saying that if you get dad to the range, you get dad outdoors, you get dad outdoors. But if you get mom to the range, you get the whole family to the range. And it's really important to get as many people in the pipeline uh, to be hunters and conservationists as possible. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, well, thanks for having me on. And um, if anyone has any questions at all, there's, there's no, uh, I won't say there's no dumb questions, but you know, feel free to shoot them, shoot them. Yeah, th thank you, John, for doing this. Uh, 